and um, this is the first uh, seminar of the cardiovascular electricity series in this fall semester. And I think those of you who have uh, seen the entire program for the year, it's really outstanding. And we're definitely starting with an outstanding speaker who is very standing to my right. So, um, Dr. Delmar received his education in Mexico, Mexico City. You see these murals that came from there. And um, then joined the group in uh, SUNY Upstate New York in the SUNY Syracuse, where he spent a good number of years with the group of Pepe uh, Calife and others. And then uh, moved to Michigan, University of Michigan, that was like 2008, 2007, moved to uh, Michigan, and from Michigan, just a short distance to New York City, <laughs> and now he lives in Manhattan and works at NYU, where he's a professor of medicine, and also uh, co-director of this translational program that they have. And Mario is really very well known in particular, and that's how we sort of connect. Because early on, I did a lot of work on the theory behind cell-to-cell -cell coupling and how it affects conduction of the action potential. And uh, Mario really did um, breakthrough work on <coughs> gate junctions and intracellular communication, among others, among other things. And, um, to say, but he received a lot of recognition and awards, from, especially from the American Heart Association. And this last February, organized the Gordon Conference that a few of you have attended. And um, there's some beautiful work that is coming out of his laboratory on complexes of the localization of sodium channels in the gap junctions and how it interacts with gap junction for humans. And in particular in the context of ARBC, ARMG, which is really a very malignant arrhythmogenic pathology. Uh, so without further ado, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Jeroen, and uh, thank you all for coming to this seminar. And uh, thank you for, to all of those that I have had the chance to uh, meet with uh, today, uh, a wonderful day. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will start first by acknowledging the people that have done uh, the work that I will present today. That way I do not forget or get rushed at the end and pass over these slides. So I'm going to show you mostly data that is already published, that was done by a former graduate student in my lab that has now uh, moved to a postdoctoral fellowship, as well as people that are currently in my lab and that have done a, a tremendous job in, um, in uh, continuing our studies. Uh, I am also very fortunate to have collaborations with a number of people that make our work possible. Uh, particularly, I will talk about super resolution microscopy with Eli Rothenberg. Uh, I collaborate with David Fendio to apply Monte Carlo simulations to what we find by super resolution. I will not touch on that. Um, we talk about the data that we obtained in collaboration with Sylvia Priori, the group in Utrecht. Uh, Dan Judge, and is not here, but Hugh Calkins, of course, and a little data that we did together with Vincent Jennings and Gail. So, um, my talk is going to be focused on the cardiac intracalitis. I am actually <clears throat> going to move maybe not more than 100 nanometers away from here for the rest of the talk. This is an electron micrograph of cardiac tissue. And this is one cardiac cell here. This is another cardiac cell in here. And the point in which one cardiac cell meets the other end to end, you find this electron dense structure. This is what is called the intercalated disk. Now, <clears throat> if you amplify that intercalated disk image, what you find is something like this. Um, I actually am showing you a picture of a book of 
about the time in which I was a medical student. So I, if I had been a better student, I should have looked at this book back then. The bottom line is this is how we understood the intercalated disk then. And at the end of the talk, I will try to change your view of how we see the intercalated disk now. The way in which we understood the intercalated disk is that there were three distinct structures within the intercalated disk. So here is one cell on this side. Here is the other cell on this side. And you can see that the space in between the cells is making these turns. There is space in between them. And at some point, it looks as though the membrane of the two cells have fused. They have not fused. There is a gap between them. And there are junctions that traverse that gap. And that's where the name gap junctions comes from. Then there are other structures, like the one that you see here, where you barely see the intercellular space, and instead you see this diffuse electron dense structure. That is the place where two cohering molecules, one coming from each cell, are projected into the intercellular space. The cohering are going to hold on to each other very tightly. And on the intracellular space, the cohering is going to connect to the acting filaments. This is how force is going to be transmitted between one cell and the other. This is what we call the adhering structures. And then there is a third structure. This one here, which has a darker edge on both sides of the cells. And this is called the desmosome. Now, these are also mechanical coupling structures. But as opposed to the adherence junction that connects to the actin and transmits force, the desmosomes are connected to desmin. Desmin is an intermediate filament. The best example, actually, of desmosomes is not in the heart. The best example is in the skin. And the intermediate filament in the skin is keratin. So if I pinch my skin and I pull it, my cells don't rip apart from each other. They stay together. And they stay together because they have desmosomes that are holding them together. And my skin stretches and then comes back because keratin is a filament that stretches and then comes back. My skin needs to be flexible so that I can do this, and so is my heart. It needs to be flexible. The heart is an extremely flexible organ. What provides the heart with its flexibility is that desmosomes keep the cells together while the desmin fibers are stretching and contracting in every part. Three structures, three different structures, a desmosome, an adherence junction, and a gap junction. In the classical description, these three structures were considered totally independent from each other. Each one had its own molecules. And God forbid the molecules of one would talk to the molecules of the other. We have done a lot of transmission EM and scanning electron microscopy. And I show you an example in here. And you can see that when you use better resolution methods, the picture that starts to emerge is different from the one that I showed you before. What you see here is not happening in time, obviously. This is a tomographic EM, so it is happening in the z-axis. In this case, this is the, in the space in between the cells. You can see a desmosome here that will come into focus now. You see a gap junction over here. There is a lot of vesicular activity that is happening between the two structures. They are very close to each other. There is a gap junction in here that is kind of sandwiched between uh, two adherence junctions in the middle. What you see here, when you look at better resolution, and when you see it dynamically, it's actually hard to believe that these molecular structures would be completely independent from each other. They are actually very close together. And likely, the components of one can be interacting with the components of the other. Add to that, <coughs> That, that was the description of the intercalated disk when all we had was electron micrographs. And so you could only see things that were electron dense. With the advent of confocal microscopy, we started to discover that there are a bunch of other molecules that preferentially localize to the intercalated disk. One of them is actually the sodium channel. So the sodium channel, NAV1.5, in this particular picture, 
Uh, I have actually taken one picture where it is mostly localizing to the intercalated disc. Depending on the antibody, you see it actually also drawing the uh, striations of the cell. I'm not going to go into that, but I think that we would all agree that the intercalated disc is a preferential site for localization of nano You can see it here, localizing at the same spot as a desmosomal protein, glycophilic 2. So in this talk, I will be talking about three, and in particular, two different components. Our laboratory is interested in the collaboration of these three complexes. Desmosomes, the mechanical junction that provides flexibility. Gap junctions, the electrical coupling that provides the passage of ions between <coughs> them. And sodium channels, the complex that allows the entry of electrical charge on each activation so that propagation can proceed. I am actually going to focus specifically in a couple of molecules, glycophilin 2 for the desmosome. As I said, I don't have time to talk about these components today, but I will be spending most of the time talking about glycophilin 2 and the sodium channel. And we have done a lot of work with Acrim G. I will also not describe it today, but the point is that what I will try to convince you at the end of the talk is that these complexes are not separate that desmosomes, and particularly the glycophilin 2 molecule, when it goes down, can affect both electrical coupling and the sodium current. That actually there are molecules of the sodium channel complex that, when you disrupt them, change both electrical coupling and intercellular adhesion. And that indeed, if you decrease the abundance of connexin 43, sodium current goes down. So what we have been coming up with is a model in which these complexes are not independent. They are actually integrating into one protein interacting network, into something that we have come to call a connexon, for lack of a better name. So other than because of the basic science interest in demonstrating that these complexes are not alone. What is the motivation for studying these complexes? The motivation comes from this disease. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. You may also see it referred to as arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, or ARVD. You may also see it referred as arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia slash cardiomyopathy, ARVDC. And more recently, because we couldn't agree with the name, we are actually tending to use the term AC, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. If you are reading the literature on this topic, they are all the same disease, but different nomenclature has changed with time. What is ARDC? It's an inherited heart muscle disease that may result in arrhythmia, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death. This is the heart of a 16-year-old boy who was playing soccer with his friends and all of a sudden collapsed and died in the soccer field. The characteristic of the disease, the characteristic signature of the disease is a cardiomyopathy in which the free wall Primar primarily of the right ventricle, but also on the left, are replaced with fibroid and adipose tissue. So as you can see here in this section through the wall of the right ventricle, the ventricular mass has been substituted by a fibrofatty infiltration. This characteristic of the disease, however, is not always the case. About 50% of the cases of ARVC Sudden death is the first manifestation of the disease. And in fact, um, it occurs without structural manifestation. So of the various molecules of the desmosome, and I will not go into the details, I am going to concentrate in a molecule called placophilin 2, or PKP2. 
And the reason why we have focused our attention on BKP2 is because, depending on the series that you read, between 50 and 70% of all the cases around the world of ARVC, familial ARVC, in which a gene culprit has been found, the mutation is in the placophilin 2 gene. The others, the vast majority of the remaining ones, are also desmosomal genes. Now, as I was mentioning before, the interesting thing about this disease is that even though its signature is a cardiomyopathy, is a change in the structure of the heart, many of the cases that have ventricular fibrillation and sudden death, the ventricular fibrillation is the first manifestation of the disease, and as we wrote in this uh, review article with Bill McKenna, the early or concealed phase of the disease is characterized by a propensity to ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death in the setting of a well-preserved morphology, histology, and ventricular function. In other words, it is not uncommon that after an episode of sudden death, in a case that is a relative of people that have the full-blown disease, where there is the genetic marker of the disease, the pathological analysis of the heart shows little or no structural deficit. So why is it that these patients have this very high propensity to sudden death? What is happening in the heart of these patients that leads to these arrhythmias? Or to make it simpler, how is it that mutations in proteins that are supposed to be the glue between the cells are actually disrupting so dramatically the electrical stability of the heart? And that has been a question that has driven my lab for the last number of years. Uh, uh, eight years, ten years, maybe. OK, so to address this question, we said, well, let's, let's see. What, what can be an arrhythmogenic substrate in ARBC? Well, the first is, of course, that the alteration of the macrostructure can be an arrhythmogenic substrate. Changes in the tissue structure and the presence of this fibrofatty infiltration can certainly set the stage for arrhythmias. But as I said, the worst arrhythmias, the worst cases of arrhythmias, happen before the microstructure disruption is completely apparent. Of course, there can also be alterations in the microstructure, and I will not go into this part of the disease, but there are indeed changes in connection that happen in the hearts of patients with ARBC. But the other angle that we took is that there could also be changes in the nanostructure. In other words, that the changes caused by the mutations in the placophilin 2 could disrupt the integrity of molecular complexes that involve ion channels and that by affecting that ion channel function you develop a predisposition or a substrate to lethal organisms. So the angle that we decided to take through the next series of uh, the next part of the project was to say, okay, could it be possible that desmosomal molecules, in addition to making a desmosome, keep ion channel complexes functioning happily in the intercalated disk, and that when the placophilin is not there, these ion channels malfunction. That is then what we call the non-desmosomal functions of placophilin 2. So the non-desmosomal functions of placophilin 2 could be, some of them could be the regulation of ion channels that are irrelevant, that are relevant for the electrophysiology of the form. So the first study that we did was this one. 
This is just to orient you a single adult ventricular myocyte that has been stained with glycophilin 2, the desmosomal molecule, lightening the intercalated disc, and with NAV1.5, that as I said is primarily at the intercalated disc, although you also see staining in the midsection of the cell. <coughs> and what we're going to do is to take these cells and with this iRNA technology eliminate the expression of placophilin 2. I remind you, this is a single myocyte. There is no desmosome here. So whatever I find in the ion kerns by eliminating the expression of PKP2 can't be because of the loss of a desmosome because there is no testing, it's just a single cell. So we use this IRNA and we indeed prevent the expression of placophilin 2 in what we call the knockdown cells, compare it to cells that were treated with a non-silencing construct or with untreated cells. And this is what we found, and this is a paper that we published uh, three years ago, about four years ago now. So, this is the sodium current in cells that were not treated. This is a family of sodium currents in cells that were treated with a non-silencing construct. And this is the sodium current in cells that do not have glycophilin 2. And what you can see is that the amplitude of the sodium current in cells that do not have glycophilin 2 is half of the amplitude of the sodium current in cells that express their glycophilin 2. Not only that, but the steady state inactivation curve of the sodium current in the absence of glycophilin 2 is significantly shifted to the left, which makes whatever is left of sodium channels even less likely to be available at the normal resting potential of minus 85 millivolts. So according to this plot, in a cell that doesn't have PKP2 at minus 85 millivolts, you would have less than 20% of sodium channels available. In a cell that has the glycophilin 2, you would have about 50% of sodium channels available. Also, a slowing the recovery from inactivation. So, the expression of glycophilin 2 in adult ventricular myocytes had a dual effect a decrease in the amplitude of the current and a shift in the <coughs> voltage dependence of inactivation. The Mark, decrease in the amplitude. Oh, yeah. Question. So the voltage clamp data were collected then with a the holding potential of minus 120 or something? Oh, minus 140. 140. Yeah. Uh, so the, um, this is just to show that the abundance of the NAV1.5 protein was not decreased in cells that do not have glycophilin 2. And this is to show that what happens in now in NRVMs, in neonatal rat ventricular myocytes, if you um, look, let me take you that the illumination is not very good, but this is the staining for glycophilin 2, drawing the site of intercellular junction in cells that obviously that do have PKP2. Cells that do not have PKP2, they show nothing. NAV1.5 is co-localizing at the site of cell-to-cell -cell contact together with placophilin 2 in these cells. When we do not have placophilin 2, we find NAV1.5, but we do not draw the point of intercellular contact. NAV1.5 in these cells seems to be in the intracellular space. So there is something that's not clear to me. When you isolate the cell and you have a single cell that is isolated now, is there a redistribution of placophilin 2 from where the disk used to be? Or there, there, where is, there is a little bit of internal... Uh, do you see it more in the... Um, instead of just marking these sharp square ends, it sort of marks around. Because the myocytes, you need a couple of days to silence the placophilin 2. And, so the and the NAV 1.5, it goes about the same Okay, so <clears throat> the um, hypothesis was that the uh, PKP2 
may be causative of arrhythmias even without having fibrosis in the heart. And of course that is not easy to demonstrate, but we decided to test the hypothesis at least in a dish. So we looked at whether we would have changes in propagation and in the generation of arrhythmias in monolayers of NRDMs if we silence platofilin 2. So we set neonatal myocyte monolayers and we set up for optical mapping of these monolayers. So for those of you who wouldn't be familiar with this, basically what we have is a dish in which we have a monolayer of ventricular myocytes and we put a pacing electrode in the center. The cells are stained with a dye that is going to be sensitive to voltage and we are going to pace and record with a video camera the activity that occurs within the dish. So when we did that, what we found is that the velocity of propagation from the site of pacing to the periphery of the cell was faster if we look at the cells that have placophilin 2 than if we look at the cells that do not have placophilin 2. You can see that in this case, this wave is taking a longer time to get to the edge when you compare it to the one that originates in that site. And actually, we found several dishes in which what we had was a constant re-entry activity occurring within the dish. In this case, you can see that there is a ro rotation center in there, another rotation center in here. This activity is going around and around without stimulation spontaneously, uh, likely as a result of the combination of the changes in sodium current that I described and the changes in a public that I have not discussed, but that also occur in these preparations. Okay, so I am going to um, uh, show you then um, the next part of the study, which is a part that we did uh, more recently, and uh, we have it uh, uh, hopefully accepted soon. And what we, what we did was to reason as follows. There is uh, an inherited arrhythmia disease called Brugada syndrome. And Brugada syndrome is characteristically the result of the loss of function of the sodium current. I have been trying to convince you that mutations in placophilin 2 cause the loss of sodium current. So the hypothesis that we proposed is that maybe there are cases of Brugada syndrome in which the mutation is in placophilin 2. Cases in which you do not develop the full-blown structural disease, but you do develop the sodium current deficiency. Mind you that about 70 to 80 percent of the cases of Brugada syndrome, a genetic cause is not found. So we said, let's take a bunch of patients with Brugada syndrome and sequence placophilin 2 and see what we find. And so that's what we heard about it. You showed the effect on the conduction and changes in the sodium current. What happens with the late sodium current? What happens to the reaction potential duration? Are there any changes there? Even though I realize this is the mouse, but still, do you see any changes in MPD? So, um, we did not do action potential morphology. Um, what we did is uh, in the myocytes. Uh, we did do um, calcium current, there is no difference. I gave one, there is no difference. Um, ATO, I believe we did, there was no difference. Um, and <coughs> the first part of your... Late sodium current. Late sodium current, there is no difference. Yeah, late sodium current, there is no difference. Um, 
related question. It seems almost unbelievable that you can actually even get a propagated signal with that steady state inactivation properties. So do you have to do something particular <coughs> like you hyperpolarize everything and then you stimulate or how does that work? Why is it just so, fade out? So I will say that the, the data that I showed you was in the NRDMs. Yeah. Um, in the PKP2 heterozygote <coughs> mouse, we have done similar experiments in their cells. The sodium current is down. The shift in steady state inactivation is not as large. Uh, it's actually is, is much less than what we find, and it only happens in the intercalated disk. Uh, why do we get an actual potential in the NRVMs propagating? What I can tell you is that the experimental data that we have, uh, Omer Berenfeld uh, and uh, Mark Dale, uh, they took it uh, for, uh, for uh, modeling. And the results of the simulations were similar to what we got in the, um, in the experiments. So well, we, we, we've done modeling many, many years ago and showed that um, you basically can get a, an action potential that can propagate with 11% yeah, of that. the expression. Yeah. Level. So when you look at the combination of reduction in the current and also the yeah. shift in the it's about 20 percent so i would say but you got that and slow recovery the, so steady state you might imagine would be even less yeah. than the 10 percent that it shows on yeah right. anyway just, yeah i mean it's I, not a calcium uh, spike uh so neonatal myocytes depend on calcium current much more than adult mm -hmm. myocytes so there is definitely in an rvms a component of the upstroke that is calcium that is, what they, their uh, DVDTs are much lower than of an adult tissue. So that component may be uh, maintained in the patient. Indeed. Was it possible? Probably not possible, but it would be interesting to compare what happens with the PKP2, what happens to sodium channels directed gap junction or interpreted disc, and what happens to sodium channels that are not there. So we did that, and I will uh, hopefully show you some at the end. The answer to that is that by doing macro batch and also by doing SICM, we can record only the sodium channels in the intercalated disk. We find in the PKP2 heterozygote myocytes, the current is decreased there. In the midsection of the cell, the current is not decreased. Not decreased. Not decreased. The T2 will also go not decreased. Uh, well, so. Uh, I don't think that there are too many NAV 1.5 channels in the I think yeah. they are in the most American ones, but yeah. yeah. I have a, just then to follow up that question. Very naive question. How, how, how much uh, is the refraction of the sodium channels in the hippocleft uh, disk, and how much is the fraction of the channels sorry, outside? Mm -hmm. So. That's a, that's a difficult question because the intercalated disk has a much larger density of channels, but of course the area is smaller. If you count then all of the channels that are in the midsection of the cell, they are more sparse, but the area is larger. Now we did a study <coughs> doing macro patch, and one thing that we found in that study is that the steady state inactivation curve of the channels in the midsection of the cell is actually to the, to the left, to the negative values of the steady state inactivation of the channels in the intercalated disk. So the balance between those things would give you a proportion of the current that comes from one side to the other that I would say is not 50-50. I think that may still be largely, under conditions of propagation, it may be largely the current that interpolated this. But that calculation specifically, we don't have, I don't have. But they, the in, one interesting thing about that is that the, the gating properties of the sodium, of the TTX resistant channels, which probably are mostly not 1.5, you know, all of them not 1.5, the gating properties are different depending on whether the channels are in the intercalated disk or in the midsection of the cell. 
which suggests that the partner protein affects the function of the channel, of the same ion channel. We probably will show, but so then the active potential in the, in, uh, in, in, in the mouse side, which part of the sodium channel will start that action potential? If they have different uh, uh, properties when you, when you see it. So, no, I will not show. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to tell, and I would leave it to future studies to, to, to address that. I think that modeling is probably a better answer than you may want to so we've done, we've done We've done modeling with, uh, remember Jan Kutsura? And he put 100% of the sodium channels in the interpreter with this. And then he put 50%, 50%. He did all kinds of ratios. And for most of the conduction conditions, it didn't make any difference. Although he took into account uh, capacitive transmission that was part of the mm -hmm. model, but mm -hmm. it only made a difference if you had a high degree of uncoupling of cells, then putting all of them in the interpreter the disk made a difference. Otherwise, you couldn't tell. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in that point, <coughs> I don't think that the subcellular distribution of the sodium channels makes an enormous difference in the ability of an action potential to be propagated. I think that where the important difference is, is in the fact that you have different molecular partners in one region or the other. And that the interaction between those partners can change the function of a particular group of channels that is dependent on the nano domain. And that disruption of function can then affect propagation. And but there is a, that was not taken into account in our simulation. Exactly. That was not known at the time. Exactly. And, and, and there is an additional point to that. I am talking about PKP2 and the sodium channels at the intercalated disk. For Duchenne cardiomyopathy, the failing interaction is between the dystrophin syntrophin complex and the sodium channel. And Hugh Abriel has done beautiful work showing that the loss of sodium current, because of the loss of that interaction, also predisposes to arrhythmia. So you have two diseases, probably coming from the same ion channel protein, that the interaction with placophilin 2 may be responsive for arrhythmia in one, at the intercalated disc, that the interaction with the syntrophin dystrophin complex may be causative of arrhythmia in the other. So I think that what matters is not the total current eventually is going to make it propagated or not, but whether particular deficits in the molecular nano environment are predisposed to disease because of the specific site in which those molecules are located. Okay, so, so, so we see is it possible that some cases of Brugada are caused by PKP2 mutations? And uh, so we took, um, this is a, the, the population that we took, and the population was a retrospective study. We took 200 patients that came from the Rogerio Foundation in Pavia. Uh, Silvia Pioli gave us the blood. We sequenced, uh, we took the clinical diagnosis of Brugada, ECG, spontaneous or flecainide induced, no structural cardiomyopathy, no mutations in SCN5A, in the calcium channel, or in a couple of other sodium <coughs> accessory proteins associated with Brugada. We found five of these cases. Five cases in which we have the typical characteristic cold shape ST segment elevation of signature of Brugada syndrome. One case in, in each one of these, a different not reported placophilin 2 mutation. In one particular case, we had blood from family members, so we were able to look for co segregation. And we found that this is our patient, uh, has a father 
with sync copy address has a mutation. We had in the previous generation a grandfather. I think that I lost the um, the battery in this, but uh, um, I can probably use the. So the uh, the grandfather was also uh, with the same copy address and uh, had the uh, the gene and has a brother with a positive flex DNA test that also has the mutation. So there is co-segregation in one family on the placophilin mutation and yet no sign of cardiomyopathy in any family matter. So how do you test this? So what we did was the following: we needed a cell where we have sodium current, but where we could put PKP2 mutations and see what happens to the sodium current. So what we did is that we took HL1 cells. HL1 cells are cardiac-like. They express PKP2 and they express the sodium current. Here you have uh, the uh, message for SCN5A is about three orders of magnitude higher than for any other. They do have NAV1.5. They express NAV1.5. They don't have PKP1. They don't have PKP3. They do have PKP2. And so what we did was to make HL1s stably deficient for placophilin 2. So we took the HL1s and we stably silenced placophilin 2. We look at the sodium current in these cells, and what we find is that now in these cells we have a significant decrease in the amplitude of the sodium current. Um, the abundance of NAV1.5 was not different, but the amplitude of the current was decreased. Now, here we have cells that have their native sodium current. If we remove placophilin 2, now we see the sodium current going down. So the next step was to put back a PKP2 wild type. And when we put the PKP2 wild type in these cells, we get a current, so these are PKP2 knockdown plus the PKP2 wild type compared to PKP2 knockdown alone. So we have HL1 cells that have PKP2 and have sodium current. We take these cells and we remove placophilin 2, sodium current goes down. We take the PKP2 wild type gene and in a transient transfection we put it back into cells, the sodium current goes back up. Okay? So now we have a system. Now we have a system where we can remove PKP2, get current down, put it back, get current up. And now I'm going to put a mutant of PKP2 and see if the current goes up or down. And obviously the mutants that we chose were the mutants that we found in the Brugada patients. So I will start in the corner over here. D26N is actually not a mutation of PKP2. It's a polymorphism that has been shown to not be disease causing. When we take PKP2 and we make the D26N mutation, the sodium current that we get from those cells is the same sodium current that we get if we put the PKP2 wild type. So PKP2 wild type, or with a little variant that is not disease causing, gives me a good, healthy sodium current. But if instead I put one of the mutations that I found in the Brugada patients, now the sodium current is less. In all of the other five, you can see now that the current that I get, the sodium current that I get, if I express PKP2 with, say, this mutation, is much less than I would get if I express PKP2 with a full length placophilin. So the system shows me that a mutation in placophilin 2 associates with a decreased sodium current. We repeated these experiments by combining the PKP2 wild type and the mutation 
in separate plasmids so that we could mimic better the case of a one allele affected and one not, which is what the patients have. Okay, so <clears throat> that is interesting what HL1s are, an atrial tumor cell line, and you can say very nasty things about using an atrial tumor cell line to model a ventricular arrhythmia in humans. So the next thing that we did was to take these cells. These are from a patient that is one of the very few cases of a uh, homozygotic uh, PKP2 deficiency that was reported by Dan George and his colleagues at Hugh Hawkins. Uh, this has a splice mutation in PKP2 and using these cells uh, Hugh and Dan George and Vincent Chen show that uh, IBS derived cardiac myocytes from this patient show a deficit in a number of characteristics associated with PKP2. So we took these cells. So these are cells derived from a patient with ARBC that have essentially no PKP2 reaching the cell membrane. We took those cells and we measured the sodium current, and I just would like you to pay attention to these three bars. These are the, this is the sodium current amplitude of the cells from the patient that has no PKP2 arriving to the membrane. We then, with lentivirus, we made the expression, we forced the expression of the PKP2 wildlife, the sodium current went back up. If instead of expressing the PKP2 wildlife, we expressed one of the mutations, the one that had the family, the segregation of the gene, then the sodium current does not go back up. So, as in the HL1s, expression of PKP2 wildlife brings the sodium current up, expression of a mutant of PKP2 associated with Brugada syndrome does not bring the sodium current back up. It associates with a decreased sodium current. So if I have five more minutes. Um, <clears throat> so what is the mechanism for this? What, how is PKP2 interacting or affecting sodium current function? That is the next question for which we have tried to resolve <coughs> at the microenvironment level what is happening between that 1.5 and PKP2. As I said, the subcellular distribution of the sodium channel shows that there is an abundance or an increased density at the end of the cell. And there was a paper by um, Abriel, uh, showing that indeed the partners that associate with the sodium channel are different if you look at the channel in the intercalated disc, and actually he was nice enough to put platinum in this diagram, uh, or in the uh, lateral membrane. So we showed that this one may have functional properties different from this one. We use a technique that I don't have much time to explain, which is called scanning ion conductance microscopy. Together with uh, Julia Borelic, we showed that you can combine this technique, which allows you to draw the topology of a live cell with nanometer resolution and combine it with patch clamps so that I can tell you that I would like to record the channels from that spot. I can use this technique to say I want to record sodium current only from the titubule in this case, or only from the costameric line that it would be here, and only from the crest between the cells. Using this method, we show that the sodium current if we record from the midsection of the cell is not dependent on PKP2. This is from uh, adult ventricular myocytes from the PKP2 heterozygote mouse, but the current at the intercalated disc is decreased in the mouse that is uh, deficient in placophilin 2. Their unitary conductances do not show differences. 
So we think that what happens is that the um, sodium channel, we know that it's trafficked by the microtubular network. And we propose the hypothesis that the microtubule needs to reach all the way to where there are glycophilin to rich areas, mechanical junction points, and that the mechanical junction points in the intercalated disc serve as the anchor for the microtubule. So proteins that travel through the microtubule system need to get all the way to the intercalated disc so that then they can be incorporated into the membrane. And we propose that the anchoring point for that microtubule is a mechanical junction. So if the mechanical junction is not intact, the microtubule is not going to be able to make it all the way to the intercalated disc, and the cargo will not be properly delivered. To do this, we did a super resolution microscopy together with Eli Rothenberg. You are actually going to meet Eli in a few weeks. I can tell you from this picture that uh, there are two things that are not true. This is what our setup looks like. Uh, but there are two things that are not true. One is that Eli never wears a white coat. <laughs> and the other is that this was a picture taken by the PR people at NYU. And uh, so they asked him to look at the microscope. Now, some of you are probably very accomplished microscopists. You know that when you do these things, you want every single photon to go to your camera. Nothing comes into the eyepiece. But they thought that the doctor needed to wear a white coat and look under the microscope so that you know, it looked more realistic. So, anyway. <laughs> so, we don't do it here. Huh? We don't do it here. No, I'm sure we don't. Um, so, I'm not going to explain the details of super resolution microscopy just to show you the results. And that is, we can stain N-cadherin and the microtubule anchoring protein EV1 at the same time. This is the image that you get from turf. This is the magnification of that area. If we do it using super resolution microscopy, the image turns from that to this. And now I can see the clusters of EV1, and I can see them arriving onto where the N-cadherin is. I can then make this type of projections where I can measure the distance between the center of an EV1 cluster and the center of the finish line, the N-cadherin site. And by doing that, really have a quantitative parameter on what is happening to the anchoring of EV1 to the N-cadherin site. And when we did this analysis, we found that the distance between EV1 and N-cadherin increases quite significantly in the cells that are deficient in blood fluid. So our current model is that the mechanical junction not only anchors one cell to the other, to the intercellular contact, it also anchors the microtubule delivery system to the intercalated disc. And so deficiencies in proteins that form that junction are going to make it harder for the cargo, including the sodium channel and the connexin channel, because they both use the same delivery system, to make it all the way to the member. And that the disruption of the microtubule PKP2 interaction is a mechanism for the development of arrhythmias in ARBC. So, so, so that, you know, the trafficking issue and the fact that it doesn't reach the interpolarities can explain the reduction in the steady state IV curve in the current. But I don't understand how it explains the change in the activation. I, I, I would say that in the conclusion, uh, we have an idea of why is the sodium current amplitude changing. What is the interaction between PKP2 and NAV1.5 that changes the steady state inactivation, I don't know what it is. I really don't know. And I don't know if it is a direct interaction or it is mediated by something else. Um, possibly it is direct. I don't see why the platophilin 2 could not be interacting with NAV1.5. Super resolution microscopy will help us 
to see the co-localization of the two of them at the interrelated disk. We are very much engaged in trying to get that, that information. Sure. <coughs> do HL1 cells have interpolated disks? No, and they do not have the shift in the gating kinetics. They only see the decrease in the sodium current energy. Uh, but you, we do not see the shift in the kinetics. Then why do you see the, you know, the decreased current in this cells, right? Because the microtubules cannot arrive to their destination. So I think that there are two things. One is you have an anchoring point where you're going to deliver channels. That failure will make the current to be low, but the one that makes it will have normal gating effects. A separate thing that happens when you have a structured cell a polarized cell, which is what the cardiac microscope is, is that in addition to that, the function of the channel at that location is going to be different. What molecularly explains that change in function? That is something that I don't know. Would it be signaling downstream plaques? Uh, it could be mediated by another interaction. <coughs> I, I don't know. It could be mediated by interaction with connections. It may be mediated by changes in the phosphorylation of the protein. I, I don't know. Yes, uh, Igor. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned that uh, the sodium channels, is it a different delivery system based on different target protein? Uh, and maybe T protein, or is it the same protein that you have in the cell? Yeah, it's the same protein. 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 So, we're, we are heading in that direction as well. So, <coughs> look, if you localize EV1, actually you can see it in the... Uh, I think in here you see it better. Uh, when you localize EV1, you not only find it in the intercalated disk, you also find it periodically distributed uh, along the striation pattern, about two microns apart from each other um, of the myocyte. So it is possible that EV1 also contributes to delivery, but may not be of NAV1.5. The trafficking of NAV1.5 to those locations is something that we really don't know. Can I ask a follow-up question? You said it's the same delivery system for connection for V3 and V1.5, but not to lateral sites. No, not to lateral sites. We have not seen connection for V3. Right. But now just to play just to play hypothesis games. It is possible that connection gets delivered everywhere but digested out immediately when it goes to the wrong place. So, you, you, make, you make an enormous amount of connection. The cell makes a lot of connection, and it gets turned around in an hour and a half. I think that the turnaround, the half-life of connection in the heart, depends very much on where it is. If it lands in the wrong spot, it's going to be minutes. If it makes it to the intercalated disk and makes a plaque, it's going to be longer. In I, the I average, Cohen just told us it's three minutes. Huh? I, I Cohen was here recently. He said it's in three minutes. It could be. I, I mean, there are, and, and I am not making this hypothesis out of nowhere. In the embryo, cadherin, in the polarized embryo, cadherin is very, very localized to the ends. But there's a beautiful paper in either Science or Nature showing that NCAT hearing makes it all around the embryo. But the um, <coughs> lateral uh, mediated system takes it out immediately from where it should not be. And so is not the polarization of CAT hearing is not a polarization of delivery. It's a polarization of internalization. And that could be happening in the heart, which don't know. And that may explain why the turnaround of connection is so fast. Yes? I'm not, I'm not sure if I, maybe I missed something, but you, when you get rid of PKP2 um, by the siRNA knockdown, or, or the trichin, whatever, you don't see any difference in NAV1.5 protein levels, correct? correct? Do you see a mislocalization? Yeah. I mean, if the mechanism of getting to the interpolated disk. Right. Uh, we do see the localizations, particularly in the neonatal myocytes, 
because those form junctions, and we see it uh, away from the junction. But the uh, by western, the abundance of nabon with light is low. Do you see that in the isolated uh, rat myocytes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. Yes, sir. I have a question with regards to the, uh, to the relation to Brugada syndrome in uh, ARVC. When you present Brugada syndrome as a sodium channel disease, if you look at the patients, 80% do not have a sodium channel mutation. If you give Ashmolin or Flecanac, for example, then you don't get structural abnormalities in patients that do, of, uh, you don't get uh, mastisignant elevations in patients uh, that do not have the Brugada syndrome. So to me, it indicates that the sodium channel is not alone sufficient to get the Brugada syndrome. And if you then look in Brugada syndrome patients, there are many studies now have already shown that there are subtle structural abnormalities present in GARDOT and in the right ventricle that are clinically not de detectable, but if you make sections, you can really clearly see it. Right. And that would very well be an explanation for the, uh, for the early ARVC patients that do, do not have uh, large structural abnormalities, but, but maybe undetectable small structural abnormalities, which easily can, can, can give a substrate for arrhythmias. So, so from your accent and from your comment, I'm going to guess that you are from the Netherlands. I am from the Netherlands. Because both things match. So, so, so you probably know also that uh, there is an alternative hypothesis to the idea that there are uh, structural abnormalities. Absolutely. In that. And uh, that hypothesis has to do with the distribution of ITO yeah. uh, across the world. That's one important point to make. Uh, uh, the point that you made at the beginning is well taken, and it is in fact part of the motivation for this, right? So you have a disease that can be either unmasked by a sodium channel challenging, mm -hmm. or that in itself presents as a sodium channel deficit. But only a fraction of patients have mutations in SCN5A, an even smaller fraction of the channel of the patients have it in the calcium channel, an even smaller fraction of the patients have it in other proteins. What we are showing here is that you get a 2.5% fraction of the patients that have it in the platelet tumor. And what it all comes down to is the idea that you can disrupt the sodium current in more ways than just mutating that one. So you would say that if you have a, a healthy heart and you only knock down plaque of fit, that you would get Brugada syndrome? Because you have high, high, uh, no, high no, 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 uh, that's, that's a very important distinction. I think that plaque too has two functions that are not necessarily related structurally. One, to make the sodium current happy. The other one, to keep the desmosome intact. I think that if the mutations are in areas of the protein that make the sodium current happy, you can have a sodium current deficit without having a structural deficit. If the mutations are in areas that are necessary for the desmosome to be happy, you are going to have a structural disease. In fact, if you ask me, in my opinion, the cardiomyopathy of ARVC is not a cardiomyocyte disease. The cardiomyopathy of ARVC, in my opinion, is an epicardial cell disease that has PKP2, that needs PKP2 to behave, and that is actually the progenitor of the fibroblasts in the heart. So the cardiomyopathy part of ARVC and the arrhythmia part in the early onset of the disease, the arrhythmia part may be separate, a separate uh, pathophysiology. Okay? Now, add to that, that indeed you have cases of Rubella syndrome where you have a structural disease. And what you have between ARVC and Rubella syndrome is not two completely different diseases, but a spectrum. Okay? I think ARVC is a late stage of Rubella And that spectrum, and that spectrum is actually covered by sharing of proteins that can give you one phenotype or the other, because at the end, the two diseases have a common nano domain where things can disrupt each other. I think part, 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 of, the, part of the problem is in, in the fact that we, 
for example, the Borgata syndrome phenotype is defined by the ECG. And those changes, J point elevation, could be because of conduction abnormalities, could be because of repolarization abnormalities, and it's not clear. You know, you have so many different mutations and different protein changes. Some can affect conduction, some can affect repolarization, some can affect both. But the outcome of it in, in terms of the phenotype is always the same. Yeah, and I think so that, that's I mean, a real problem in, in the nomenclature. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And, and I think that, I mean, Arthur's hypothesis is very well taken. Arthur Gilda's hypothesis is very well taken. And, and he's, he's, probably, he's probably right. I don't think that we can dismiss uh, the, the alternative hypothesis. And, uh, and I think I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, I am not invested in either one of them. I am perfectly open to the possibility that one or the other uh, hold, hold the ground. And both, and both are, are indeed. Yes. So, is there any other type of sodium channel in the nuclear field? <laughs> I remember that uh, there was uh, sodium channel 1.2 that is also in there. Uh, uh, so, did you see? Any difference with, with the expression of that channel? So, so that's not in <coughs> this study. We, we have a, the paper where we did the macro patch. So when we did the macro patch, we looked at the TTX resistant current and versus the TTX sensitive current. When you look at the amplitude of the current at the intercalated tissue, before or after nanomolar concentrations of TTX, <coughs> the current is the same. If you do the same experiment in the midsection of the cell, the current decreases. We have done that, we have it published with SICN, we have looked for the TTX sensitive channel in the cardiac myocyte. And our results suggest that the TTX sensitive channel in the cardiac myocyte is in the T2B. The TTX resistant channel is not in the T2B. Is in the costa, in what I think is in the costa. I show you a picture of that. The NAV 1.5 colocalizes with dextroglycan beautifully by a super resolution. So I think that there, are, there's, there is, there are TTX uh, sensitive channels in the heart, and at least from our experiments, functionally, functionally, the TTX sensitive channel is in the tubule and not in the. Do you know whether the phytophyllin binds directly to the sodium channel, and if so, where? I mean, in your cartoon, it was pretty big. Yeah, no, I, I don't. Uh, so, if you so you co-express them, do they IP? <coughs> they IP. And can you do sort of mutation studies to figure out how to disrupt that? Or? Yeah. So, so one of the one of the reasons why we hadn't gotten into that is because we really we're not happy with the expression systems until we got the HL1 system to work. So now with the HL1 system working as I, as I showed you, that's a system where we want to, to look at structure function and then see about co-IP experiments and then look at domain-domain interactions. I mean, as you very well know, uh, in vitro domain-domain interactions are very, very complicated, um, very time consuming. Is not, is not, I mean, the technology is there, but it's a very time consuming proposition, and uh, we just haven't gotten to, to that. Yes? You mentioned that the other currents are not changed, like calcium and ITO. Are the, is the mislocalization, is there any mislocalization of those channels mm. to different currents? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And unfortunately, my Potassium channel friends tell me that the antibodies are not good, right? Uh, to really localize uh, uh, potassium channels uh, with a with a good degree of accuracy, uh, so I I couldn't uh, I could not answer that. Um, there is a there is a paper by Glenn Radis that says that um, there is uh, a um, intercalated disc. Cortact independent expression of uh, KV 1.5, I think. Um, but I, we, I don't know it. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell. Okay, well, thank you so much. <laughs>